Wall Street Memes Casino. I'm fine. And Sportsbook. I'm fixing that up. Andrew McCaw, IFL TV. Got to see I'm delighted again to be joined third time in about a month, Mr. Dan Raphael. How's things? We got to start meeting like this. Yeah, well, I hope it's face to face very, very shortly. I, I need to get back to the stateside uh, very, very quickly. It seems like you've got massive fights out there. We've spoke about, well, touched on it. The, the Garcia and Haney press conference that just happened about an hour ago, if that half an hour ago in New York. Canelo's yep. now making a lot of noise. Might maybe fighting Mungia. There's the Crawford free agency. Do you know what I mean? So it's uh, exciting, exciting time stateside. But I think the topic that I want to jump on right away is this Canelo splitting with the PBC and looking like he's heading back over to to, to match room. I just want to get your initial thoughts on that. I know you've, you've wrote about it in your newsletter. If people want to get uh, Dan's proper thoughts on that, I'm sure it'll be in the newsletter. Check the description for the link. Um, yeah, Dan, PBC splitting with uh, Canelo. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, my thoughts are uh, they they did this three-fight agreement that they took care of back, uh, you know, back uh, several months ago prior to when he fought the fight. Uh, against Jermell Charlo, that was the first fight on what was supposed to be a three-fight deal. Now it comes time to get fight number two situated, and they were not able to agree on some of the particulars. Now, in the original agreement, from what I am told uh, by sources, frankly, on both sides, so I believe them, in that agreement, there were uh, opponents that were laid out for those three fights for certain price points. As I've come to find out, those three opponents were Jermell Charlo, who we just fought and beat in the last fight, Jermall Charlo, who has sort of been everybody's sort of leader in the clubhouse to get this match uh, before things got sideways. And the other opponent that was specified was Errol Spence Jr. But obviously Errol Spence Jr. is coming off of a very, very harsh loss against Crawford. And, and that was not a fight that I don't think anybody in good conscience could even remotely think about doing. So... They were, they were open to doing other possible names, doing Crawford, uh, you know, doing uh, uh, Jaime Mangia, you know, and maybe having him come over to their platform to do the fight. The point is, though, they couldn't come to an agreement of the opponent to him to fight. And there was a move. There was a, a thought on the PBC side that we want you to do a fight. We'll do the Charlo fight against Jamal for your guarantee, which I am told was north of thirty five million dollars. But. You have to agree in fight number three to fight David Benavides, who was not contemplated in the original paperwork, even though he's by far the best opponent that PBC has in its stable of fighters, if not the best opponent, period, that he could fight in terms of excitement and obviously huge amounts of uh, buys and that sort of thing. And they and Canelo was like, well, if you want me to amend my agreement, you know, you got to we got to work that out. And they just couldn't come to a, a meeting of the minds on that. He. He didn't want to fight David for that price. He didn't want to take a haircut on the Charlo fight if he was only going to fight him and not agree to the Benavides fight. And, you know, you start going through the process and PBC's, their their internal thoughts were, we lost money on the other Charlo fight. We'll probably lose money on this upcoming May fight being their, their uh, you know, on Amazon Prime now. And it's not a big name opponent, relatively speaking. Uh, but we'll do that if you agree to fight the Benavides fight or even Crawford, for that matter, who we believe are A-level fights for, you know, big, big business. That we give you the two second tier fights. We got to get a payoff in the last fight of the deal. And they could not work out either the order of the opponents, the number of dollars for those opponents or mm. which opponents they would be. And at that point, he was free to go and uh, and part ways. Now, I'm told on their side that if they wanted to continue to work with PBC and PBC wanted to continue to work with him, he would, he would honor the deal under the terms that it was agreed to, which is a certain amount of money for that Charlo fight and the third fight, you know, after that, but not going to agree to it today. Uh, obviously matchroom boxing is talking to him. There may be some other suitors out there willing or interested to talk to him. Uh, it looks though that he's going to go back towards matchroom and, you know, the names in the, in the process there, you're talking about Edgar Berlanga who just won Saturday by knockout. And obviously, Jaime Mungi, who's not with Matchroom, but he's on DAZN with Golden Boy. And that's a fight that their their side would like to have. DAZN would be interested to do that fight. And I know that the people at Golden Boy and Jaime Mungi are interested to do that fight. So, you know, that's the way things go. He he uh, he went and did one fight out of three, and it looks like that's over. 
Who's at fault here then? Is it, is it Canelo or PBC? Because you know yourself, Dan, you're on Twitter and Instagram and whatnot. You hear what the fans say, or Canelo's scared of Benavidez. That's the reason why he's left. But is it the fact that PBC couldn't get him that second fight against a big name on Cinco de Mayo? What, who's at fault here, do you believe? I think both sides have their... I, I, I can't tell you that it's one side's fault or the other. That there's definitely both sides have a perspective on this deal. And I don't think either one of them are necessarily wrong. If you're, again, I'm not taking sides because, you know, I don't, it has no impact on my life whatsoever. I mean, if Canelo fights for a PBC uh, kind of event, you know, I'll write about that and go cover it. If he's fighting on a matchroom event and whoever I'll write and cover about that. I, I couldn't care less who the, the, the outlet is or the broadcaster or the promoter or whatever. I mean, I, I deal with all these different outfits, no problem. So that said, it seems to me that they're in a situation where Canelo Alvarez has a contract that he's promised X number of dollars to fight Jamal Charlo. Mm. Okay, let's do it. And on the on the PBC side, they just took losses. You know darn well that a, a Jamal Charlo fight is is dead on arrival. That fight is just not a good fight. I mean, for a lot of reasons, he looked bad in the fight when he came back after 29 months out of the ring. He's never really been a full-fledged super middleweight. Um, his brother looked absolutely horrendous in the fight against Canelo. A lot of the people in the public will think it's a rematch because they're twins. Their names are basically the same. Mm -hmm. I'm not, that may not be fair, but that's just the reality. And so they're like, okay, you know, we'll do it, but you got to give us the third fight against Benavides or potentially Crawford for X number of dollars. And those fights were not in the agreement. So why should Canelo, his perspective, why do I have to change the deal? I don't, I'm not changing the deal. This is what we agreed to. So I see both sides of the coin. So I'm not going to assign blame to either side. Canelo has his perspective and uh, Al Heyman and their team have their perspective and neither one is right and neither one is wrong. This whole Benavides thing, I know you, Dan, as, as, a, as, a, as a correspondent, a, new, uh, a writer, you, you know boxing inside and out and you know when you're writing about fighters, what fights make sense. So when you look at this super middleweight division and you look at Canelo, Canelo and you look at Benavidez, we're seeing fights, like I said to you, but like we've spoke before that fights are getting made that we want to see. We just need to go back to Earl Spence and uh, Crawford. The fight that was in the, the sort of mixing pot for a long time, we, we got to see it. Tank Davis, Ryan Garcia, maybe as well. We get, we're getting to see that. We got to see that, sorry. This Benavidez and Canelo fight is a fight as a fan of boxing, I want to see it. And I'm guessing as a fan of boxing that you want to see. Um, of course. How do we get this fight made? Obviously, money talks. Is it all about money? Or is it Canelo at that stage of his career right now where he's like the Floyd Mayweather? He can just pick whoever he wants to fight and that's him. He is. He's in that stage. I mean, but here's the thing. If you believe David Benavides, his promoter, who was Samson Lukowitz, and they work with PBC, and others who said it without having their names identified, but everybody sort of agreed on that they made an offer to Canelo to fight David in September for $55 million. They would have done that in May, $55 million. And Canelo uh, did not accept that. So now Eddie Reynoso, who was Canelo's trainer and his manager, uh, not, not to me personally, but I saw some things where he uh, was either quoted or maybe on his social said that 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 he never got that kind of offer so i don't know who to believe there but you know obviously that's the best fight in the weight class it's not even up for conversation they're all doing these mental gymnastics about well here's the reason why you should do Munguia. here's why you should do you know charlo here's why you should do berlanga here's why we should do this guy here's do this guy david benavides is the fight he's undefeated he just come off two wins in 2023 against top level opponents he knocked out demetrius andre who was undefeated he had an excellent victory that he dominated the second half of the fight against Caleb Plant. Um, those are two big time names in that weight class that he won with no controversy and made it exciting. Did decent business on his own, not necessarily at the Canelo level, but showed that with the right fight, he can, he's a growing pay-per-view attraction. He's also, by the way, he's the interim WBC champion. He is uh, Canelo Alvarez's mandatory within the WBC, even though they haven't officially ordered the fight, but he is the mandatory fighter that will be, presumably will be ordered at some time in the future. Um, and it, But Canelo is at a stage in his career where, to some people, he's earned the right to pick and choose. You can agree with that. You can disagree with it. But it's his life. It's his career. Uh, and he still can make a lot of money 
by fighting anybody. And so maybe he's thinking, why do I want to tangle with a guy that's five years, six years, eight years younger than me, who is tough, who is a big puncher, who's got great stamina, who's got a good chin, who is bigger than me. I don't need that trouble in my life. Now, I can't say that he's that that's his perspective. That's just what it seems like. Canelo, for his entire career, has fought the guys that we wanted to see him fight. They may not have always been at the exact moment, but he, the guys he did face, you can't argue with the with the resume. The guy, when he was a young fighter, fought Floyd Mayweather. He fought Triple G twice. Well, he fought him three times, but twice when Triple G was still, you know, an elite fighter. He fought any number of guys. He fought guys like Arislandi Lara and Austin Trout when they were in their primes and at their peaks, when his own team wanted him to not do those fights. You know, he fought Miguel Cotto when he was the middleweight champion. Mm. He went up and white and he fought Sergey Kovalev and won a title. He went up and fought Dmitry Bivol, who nobody calls out. My point is, you can't argue with the long history of Canelo Alvarez, not just fighting great names, but fighting them at a time when it was meaningful because either they were still at an elite level or they had a world championship. You can't argue with that. Now, if there's this one particular time uh, as he gets towards the twilight of his own career where he sees other opportunities, and by the way, was not in the contract, and they want him to amend the contract, which he's under no obligation to do, he made a decision that he was going to stick to his guns. And if you want to continue with the contract that you agree to and that I agree to, you pay me my money for the Charlo fight. And then we'll conclude the third fight. We'll deal with that afterwards. But he mm -hmm. wasn't going to sign to fight David Benavides now when he was under no obligation to do so, when he still had the 35 million or whatever it was coming to him for a Charlo fight. You ask, how do we get the fight? We don't get the fight unless Canelo says, I want the fight. It ain't fucking rocket science. <laughs> when you put it like that, Dan, I agree with you. Um, <laughs> you think, like you said in your tweet as well, you said that highly likely is going to go over to, to match from Canelo. Um, but Canelo said that he doesn't want to fight a, a fellow Mexican, but it seems like this Jaime Munguia fight, which I'm excited about. I'll, I'll Listen, I'll pay the pay-per-view or I'll, I'll try and get ringside seat as a press guy over there. I'll fly over to the States and watch that fight because I'm excited about that fight. But it seems like uh, uh, Canelo has squashed any sort of idea that he doesn't want to fight Mexicans if he's up for the idea of fighting Jaime Munguia on Cinco de Mayo. I'm not so sure him saying I don't want to fight Mexicans was a resolute uh, statement that I'm never going to fight a Mexican. I And maybe something was lost in translation because I don't speak Spanish and it was explained to me that his preference is not to fight a Mexican fighter. It didn't necessarily mean that he wouldn't fight a Mexican right. fighter. And he has fought Mexican fighters in the past. Right off the top of my head, like he fought, for example, Alfredo Angulo, mm -hmm. clearly a Mexican boxer. He fought him. And I'm sure if I went through his entire resume, we could find other Mexican fighters that he has faced. So I don't necessarily look at that as any kind of like deal killer or anything like that. And I happen to agree with you. If he's not fighting against uh, Benavides, and even let's say for the example, he's not fighting Crawford, which commercially is still a very big fight and, you know, intriguing from the fantasy aspect, because you do have Crawford as the welterweight champ, but also more notably, most people have him now as the pound for pound number one after he demolished Spence. Um, that the next available guy that I would most be interested in to watch him fight just out of pure entertainment value is Jaime Munguia because he's going to come forward. They're going to mix it up. He's going to brawl with him. He's got a good chin. He's got good power. You know, he's proven himself to some degree in the super middleweight division just by the mere fact. And obviously this was a big talking point when the fight happened, he knocked out John Ryder and did a real job on him. And even though Canelo uh, last year beat John Ryder also and knocked him down, he was forced to go 12 rounds. The point is, that when you compare the common opponent, it was Jaime Munguia that had a better performance against John Ryder than Canelo Alvarez did. On the flip side, you could say, well, you know, Canelo Alvarez spent 12 rounds beating him up and softened him up for you. You can argue that also. But the result is, is that one guy knocked him out and the other guy didn't. And now there's maybe a reason to have them fight each other other than just the fact that it is on paper a tremendous battle. And, you know, I suspect that that's one of the fights that if he does sign with Matchroom, that's probably one of the fights we'll see in the next two bouts because that's a fight where even though Matchroom doesn't promote Munguia because they're both associated with the zone, even though Munguia is with Golden Boy, that's a fight that they want that I think is very makeable. Mm. And it, like, what what do you think about that? You mentioned Ed, Edgar Belanga at the start of this as well when his name has been put forward. Does that sort of fight excite you? I know Edgar Belanga has got to that number one spot in the WBA after his fight against Paddy McClory at the weekend there, but Edgar Belanga, is he that name yet in the States to, to fight Canelo? 
I mean, he's got a good name, but it's not a name that's going to say, I got to see him fight Canelo Alvarez, it doesn't seem to me. And I think the fact that he won the WBA Eliminator, uh, they didn't really talk about this when they talked about it being an Eliminator. First of all, that Eliminator tag was placed on the McCrory fight on Friday, like literally the day before the fight. Like uh, Chris Mannix, who does the DAZN broadcast, is a friend of mine for many, many years. And when the fight was over, and I, I mean, I, I'm pretty, you know, honed in and, and up with the minutia, and I update my schedule all the time on my newsletter. Like, I had never seen or heard anything about this being a WBA eliminator. And then I heard about it. And so when the fights were over, I was texting with Mannix, and I was like, hey, by the way, when did this become a, a super middleweight WBA elimination fight? He said Friday. So that elimination tag doesn't make Edgar, as the winner of the match, the mandatory for Canelo. I believe, and maybe the WBA could tell me if I'm inaccurate here, I believe what it does is it makes uh, Berlanga the mandatory challenger for the WBA regular champion, which is David Morrell, who, by the way, is another fighter that's an outstanding fighter in the super middleweight division that's with PBC that was also not part of uh, the contract as one of the names that he could fight as a possibility in those three matches. That would be another guy that would be acceptable and that would probably be, you know, even though David Morrell doesn't have a whole ton of fights, would be, I believe, a competitive fight. You can just tell watching this guy, you know, he may not have a ton of uh, professional experience, but he was a, a standout Cuban amateur and really, you know, is way beyond his his uh, his years in terms of maturity, in terms of in the ring. He's a really outstanding fighter. So that was another guy that might have been a possibility that won't happen now with this uh, PBC relationship coming to an end. Um, but in terms of Berlanga, look, I like Edgar. You know, he's been a fun fighter to watch. You know, he hasn't had the big knockout streak uh, over the last few fights after having all those, you know, 16 KO ones in a row. Five fights went the distance. He got back to the knockout ways by stopping McCrory. Uh, you know, on Saturday night. But being honest, I mean, has he earned the shot at the undisputed super middleweight champion? The reality is no. But if you know that you're going to get Munguia also, I mean, I guess it is what it is, you know, and people have the option if they don't want to spend the pay-per-view, they don't have to buy the pay-per-view and send a message that way. If you like the fight, and there will be a lot of people that will like the fight because of the Puerto Rican support that Berlanga will have, you know, maybe it does make it economically possible and reasonable for them to do. But I think any 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 boxing fan would look at the lineup of opponents and say, you know what, Berlanga is not number one, two, three, four on my list of guys I want to see him fight. That's fair. So single de mile is Munguia top of the top of the list right now. Well, my reporting indicates that that the folks at the zone, their preference would be to do Munguia first and then Berlanga in the September slot, and that Canelo's preference is to do Berlanga in May and then do uh, Munguia in September. How that's going to get squared away, you know, who knows? That's obviously a conversation they have to do. And they'll presumably, uh, you know, get in the get in the boardroom or whatever with his team and and they'll hash it out. Okay, well, let me put this to you then. You mentioned Crawford fighting Canelo and it's a fantasy thing. Now, we've heard that Crawford has became a free agent because of yep. uh, the Spence clause has expired to fight the, the rematch with um, Errol Spence. So he's now a free agent. Where does Crawford go? Can, is he just going to hover in that free agency and see who gives him the best offer? Because I'm looking at that welterweight division. I'm like, there's not really anybody left for him to fight at 147, if I'm being honest. No, you're Barrett, right. Mario Barrio. No, right. I, don't, I don't see anyone in that 147-pound division for him to fight. So where does he go? Who's got the best 154-pounders, maybe 160-pounders? Can you see him going anywhere? Can you see him Eddie Hearn or Golden Boy or anyone giving him an offer? I mean, listen, when you have that, when you're the number one fighter in boxing pound for pound, you got to figure somewhere there's a suitor for your services. Mm. I mean, Terrence Crawford has proven himself to be a great fighter, a future Hall of Famer. You know, he's done uh, what what fighters dream about. He's not only become a champion, he's become a champion in multiple divisions. He's become undisputed champion in two weight classes. He's won a whole ton of belts. Uh, and clearly, and he's, you know, he's shown himself to be entertaining and crowd pleasing in many of his fights, most of his fights. So from that point of view, yeah, you'd want to be associated and promote Terrence Crawford. But you just made the point, like, who's he going to fight? Now, obviously, it takes two to tango. And the difference between Canelo and Crawford is that Canelo has established the point that he can do a floor on pay-per-view of a certain level, even against a, a much lesser opponent. Crawford has not been able to even establish, like, a good floor for his fights. When he's fighting Errol Spence, they did a nice number. But it didn't blow the doors off. It's not like it did a million buys. It did a very strong number. I forget exactly what it was. I want to say somewhere like in the 600,000 range, maybe 700,000 range, which is nothing to sneeze at, by the way. But it takes that level of super fight for Crawford to get into that stratosphere of, of buys. And if you just go in there and match him up with a regular opponent, 
he's going to struggle on pay-per-view because he, you know, it's not a knock on his abilities. He just does not have that magnitude of a fan base. And in the end, this is a business and they're going to run the numbers. And if you can prove that you can earn that kind of money because you bring in that kind of huge amount of sponsorships and ticket sales and obviously pay-per-view revenue, then, you know, we're, we're in business. But if you haven't been able to do that, you're going to struggle. So I think that he can get fights against top names. Um, and I don't know exactly what he's asking for in terms of what his purse requests are. But one would think that after the amount of money he made in the in the Crawford Spence fight, that he's not going to want to go backwards. And the reality may be that a promoter may not want to take the risk and spend that much money of what it would take to get him in the ring. It's, it's going to come down to what's the appetite for Crawford to, to fight for a certain minimum. And what's the appetite for a promoter to put up, you know, a, an amount of money that they don't feel like they're going to get hurt on, but will still, um, you know, be enough for Crawford to be willing to fight. And then, of course, you got to figure out who does he fight? Who are the top super middleweights? To me, anyway, I mean, so Jamel Charlo is still the champion, even though he got beat by Canelo, but that was in the heavier weight. But he yeah. seems inactive right now, uh, sort of disinterested in, in fighting, has let himself be stripped of various belts for mandatory purposes. Uh, you know, there's other contenders out there, but to me, the fight that at least in that weight class is the most interesting is if Tim Zhu defeats Keith Thurman on March 30th, uh, who's also with involved with PBC. Now you're talking, that's a very interesting matchup. You got Tim Zhu, who's had a, a bunch of good performances in a row. He's got the WBO title. Um, you know, presumably if he defeats Keith Thurman, that'll be a nice name on his record. He's exciting. You know, he's good to, to interview and to talk. He can certainly talk up a fight. He's got the famous father who's in the Hall of Fame. We all know what Crawford brings to the table. Now, that's a good, legit, bona fide world championship matchup. I was going to say that to you. I was going to give you the sort of like the one, because obviously the well-weight division I'm looking at, I'm saying there's nobody there for him to fight. I was going to say Tim Drew at 154, but then you go up to 160 and you've got guys like, Again, from marketability standpoint and the commercial stand, you've got the Chris Eubank Juniors, but I don't I don't know what that is. But who else is there? Yanabex, is he at that stage? Yeah, you know he's a world champion. No, I mean, Charlo one, up there. 160, but, unfortunately, is just not a great division. You mentioned Eubank. I mean, that would be a probably a big deal in the UK, fair. But in the United States, that's not really anything that's gonna make people run out to buy pay-per-view. Now, if he wants a really good competitive fight, but maybe not a super fight in terms of pay-per-view, obviously Boots Ennis had 147. Uh, that's, you know, he's a super talented fighter. I think a lot of people out there would give Boots yep. Ennis, you know, a, a serious chance to to certainly compete with uh, Crawford, if not possibly defeat him. But again, I'm not saying I'd be opposed to that. I mean, I'm a diehard. I'd definitely pay money to see that fight. But I totally get why Crawford would be like, I don't need that because it's he's really of a different era in, in one sense. He hasn't really proven it against the top level of opponents because as talented as John Boots Ennis is, his resume is is pretty pedestrian it's not his fault i know that their team would fight whoever but getting guys to fight him is very very difficult he even got himself into a mandatory position ended up getting the interim title and he ended up inheriting it and becoming the main title holder because it was uh you know crawford wasn't going to do the mandatory so he's in a position in his career where you know in a similar manner to canelo he can pick and choose uh that's what happens he's made huge amounts of money not as much as canelo but a shitload of money over the last several fights and, uh, you know, he's going to look for the biggest possible event. And while on a competitive basis, Boots Ennis would probably provide that, on a commercial basis, he simply won't. It seems like the only fight for uh, Crawford's Canelo, then. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if you're, if you're, if you're Terrence Crawford, that would be uh, your dream fight. Uh, the question is, you know, how interested is uh, Canelo Alvarez for that? He said time and again, it's not something that interests him. I think he views it like he's in a kind of a no-win situation. If I win the fight, okay. You know, I beat a guy, you know, three. I mean, it was one thing when he fought the 154 Charlo people, you know, gave him a little grief about that. That was two weight classes. Now you're talking about fighting a Terrence Crawford, who's uh, three weight classes less, who was at, you know, a championship level for the first time all the way down at 135 pounds. So he feels I would imagine I don't he didn't tell me this, but I kind of get the impression that I'm in a no win situation. If I go and I fight the welterweight and I lose, it's like well, he lost to a welterweight. And if I beat him, it's like I was supposed to beat him. He's a welterweight. Mm -hmm. So. You know, again, I guess money would talk, and I don't, I don't know for sure that there's been some kind of offer made for that fight. But I do think that, uh, you know, in addition to the David Benavides fight, in terms of a commercial success, you know, him against Crawford would be a pretty big deal because now you're bringing in the, the like I said, the fantasy aspect, the, the pound for pound conversation. 
you're bringing in, you're not fighting a Mexican American, you're fighting a black American, American brings a different audience. They bring totally different audiences. And that's how you make a real big fight when both sides have distinct constituencies that make a fight must see for all of them, as well as the casual sports fan, because a Canelo Crawford fight is the kind of matchup that would pique the interest, I believe, of the, of the occasional boxing fan that might buy, you know, one, maybe two pay-per-views every now and again, because they're big names. And it's, you know, it's the fantasy, fantasy boxing, because it's the two great champions in different weight classes coming together for a big fight. Undisputed against Undisputed. And I know, Dan, that you've, uh, you've been around Canelo and you've been around Terence Crawford and, you could almost think that if you never knew boxing and somebody said to you, do you think them two are in the same weight class? You would say, yeah, because they're not, I don't think the size difference is. You're right. I agree. You know I mean, it's like the, the same size in terms of height, maybe Canelo's a little bit more thicker, but if you were to look at them, you would think they were in the same weight class. Well, one thing you have to remember is that Canelo has never been like a big super middleweight. He started his career as a welterweight. He won his first world title at junior middleweight, built himself up to a middleweight. And, and, and is outstanding as a super middleweight, but a little bit undersized, if you ask me. You know, it just shows you the talent level that Canelo Alvarez possesses. But if you, you're right, if you put Terrence Crawford, you know, in, in when they're not training for a fight and they're just in their everyday life of, of not preparing for a boxing match and you stuck them uh, next to each other and took a picture, you wouldn't really necessarily think one guy was so much bigger or smaller than the other. About the same height, I think. Like you said, Canelo's a little thicker, but, uh, you know, Crawford is... Uh, is uh, is probably uh, you know he's not tall but he he's long and it 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 looks like a fair fight but the thing to me always is Canelo's used to fighting bigger guys mm. he's used to being hit by those bigger guys he's fought as heavy as light heavyweight Eddie Reynoso spoke at one point about seriously pursuing a fight for one of the cruiserweight titles you know that Terence Crawford has never fought above the welterweight division so there is definitely you know you know what do they say weight classes were created for a reason now when you're super special when you're an elite, elite fighter, you know, an extra, a division here, a division there shouldn't really make that big of a difference. But when you're fighting another elite guy, it can become a difference. If Terrence Crawford at his level now was just fighting some regular super middleweight, you might actually favor him to win the fight. Mm. When you're fighting Canelo Alvarez, who's the best of the bunch, maybe that's a different story. I think about like covering Roy Jones against John Ruiz. Mm. Roy was, you know, not a particularly big light heavyweight at that time. Had started his career weighing in the 150s ultimately fought John Ruiz for the WBA heavyweight title, you know, went in the ring out, outweighed by probably 30, 35 pounds. Roy, my recollection being at the weigh-in for that fight was probably like, you know, 194, maybe something like that for the fight. John Ruiz, like in the uh, definitely 220s at maybe a little more. And Roy shredded him, won every round because Roy was a great smaller guy fighting just an average bigger guy. But if Roy Jones, the great smaller guy was in the ring that night fighting the great big guy. Let's say he was fighting Lennox Lewis that night, who was the real champion at that time. I don't know if we would have the same result to put it to you like that. Mm. It's definitely interesting. And it's like, we almost want these fights to hurry up and just get made that we, we're, it's, it's, you know, yourself, Dan, you're just sitting here wondering and pondering, can this fight get made? Can this fight, what's the promoters doing contracts and all this stuff. And it's boxing can be frustrating. But yes, sir. It is the best sport in the world because we do get the drama. And I, I suppose all this press conferences and contract negotiations and this, that, and the next thing always adds to it. So that probably, get, I've got 10 minutes left on the Zoom call. So that adds me nicely onto this press conference that happened out in New York um, about an hour ago in Devin Haney and Ryan Garcia. There's a narrative there that they've had six fights, they've six amateur fights, albeit it's three mm -hmm. apiece. This is the, the decider, the one that counts in the pro ranks. Um, can you can you can you pick a winner? Can you split them? Well, first of all, just for your your earlier point, I mean, I know it's frustrating in terms of like yes. certain fights don't get made, but the reality is we do get a lot of good fights. Also, we are getting Haney versus Garcia. We got Haney versus Tank Davis. You know, we're getting Arthur Better Bev against Dimitri Bivol for undisputed. We've gotten plenty of quality fights. I mean, you so sick, yeah. from that standpoint, I mean, you know, there's always something to quarrel and quibble that fight. But we're and we're in this fight between. Between uh, Haney and Ryan Garcia is a first class fight. So can you pick a winner? Look, I have to favor Devin Haney as the consummate boxer. Better, you know, good defense, good slickness, has has a has a better caliber of victories on his record. Uh, not only defeating Lomachenko, albeit closely, twice going on the road and defeating uh, George Cambosis in Australia, going 
in the ring in his first fight at 140 pounds and winning, not just winning, but winning hands down, scoring a knockdown and winning 12 rounds to zero against Regis Progre, who was an excellent fighter in his own right. So, you know, Ryan doesn't have that level of accomplishment. And the one big fight that he had, he got knocked out against Tank Davis. So, and I think Ryan is a, he's a smart enough fighter to understand why uh, media and public would make him the underdog, but you can't underestimate, you know, his desire, his quickness, uh, his punching power, that left hook is fantastic. And he knows that even if it wasn't under different circumstances as an amateur boxer, he's defeated this man three times. Mm-hmm. And likewise, Devin Haney's defeated him three times. Now, Haney was the one that won the last of the six fights. So does he have a little bit of an edge because it's most recent? I don't know about that. I don't put a whole ton of stock in it. I think their amateur fights against each other is more interesting for us who are going to write about it and think about it and and watch it then it means to them in terms of as they're preparing to fight the fights because they're far different fighters today as grown men than they were when they were boxing as amateurs when they were like, you know, 17, 18 years old. I agree. And uh, I'll, I'll ask this question quickly. We, obviously, Ryan Garcia is, is the underdog and Derek James at the press conference literally stood in that podium for a minute, said his piece and got off. And I, I like that. I like when some a guy's just down to business. He's not there to, to talk and trash talk and all that sort of stuff. So I'll put this question to you, Dan. Can Derek James make a difference to Ryan Garcia in this fight? Because we know he's got a good left hook, but there's more to boxing than just a good left hook. Absolutely. And Derek James is a A-level trainer. I mean, the, the record of that he has with his fighters, with Charlo, with Spence, he, you know, he's not working with them anymore, but he's, uh, you know, got, got the results with Anthony Joshua. I mean, I have massive respect for Derek James. He's, you know, he doesn't take a lot of shit from his fighters, but he's also, uh, he's not, he's not, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not like he's not willing to, to mold towards what the fighters uh, best attributes are. So he knows what he's doing when it comes to preparing fighters at the top level. So, you know, can he make a difference? I don't know about a difference, but he can certainly do a great job of preparing Ryan Garcia for the fight. And look, I thought, you know, Ryan Garcia before that was with Joe Goose and Joe is a great trainer also. And Joe's in the hall of fame and, and he's had, uh, you know, top trainers. There's more than one great trainer in boxing. So I think Derek James, uh, you know, as long as Ryan is committed to him and the game plan and training his ass off and being in the right frame of mind mentally, being in the proper physical condition, uh, you know, Derek can do the best that he can do to get the best out of him. That's really what, what you want. And you know what? At the end of the day, and I've said this, I'm not Monday morning quarterbacking here, from the first time I ever started to cover boxing and started to understand the dynamic that works between trainers and fighters, what you think about their training Union, what I think doesn't mean anything. It's about does the trainer have faith in the fighter? And more importantly, does the fighter have faith in the trainer to go in and want to run through a wall for that trainer and do what he asked him to do in the gym? That's what counts. And if Ryan Garcia has that feeling with Derek, then that's all we have to worry about. I don't think he had that feeling with Joe for whatever reason. I think Derek may be a little bit of a different scenario. I like that. I, yeah, I agree with that 100%. But one thing that's been bothering me for the last couple of times I've spoke to you, Dan, you in the face. Who's them guys behind you in the face masks? I can't figure that out. I thought it was Ricky Hatton to begin with. Yeah. One of them is Ricky Hatton. That what was like it? a thing that gave away at a fight that I've always just had pinned up on my desk. I didn't even realize it was in the shot until I had a few people comment about it. And the other one is from another fight where they gave out face masks of Manny Pacquiao. Oh, so it's Ricky and Manny. All right, good. Exactly. I always thought I was thinking, like, is that Ricky Hatton looking right back at me? But if I turn my camera around, you'll see all my boxing shit all over my my office, which I'm not going to do right now. But maybe that's another. Ep- maybe that'll be an episode like uh, Cribs. <laughs> the MTV Cribs with an MT- MTV Cribs with Dan. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, Dan, listen, absolutely pleasure. Thank you so much for spending your your Tuesday evening with me. Um, well, evening in the UK, afternoon for you in the in the states, and uh, yeah, hope you have a good week, and I'll speak to you soon, my friend. Andrew, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you, mate. Bye-bye now. Wall Street memes casino. I'm fine. And sportsbook.